we'll go through the <laughs> go through the state today <laughs> um, <laughs> to kind of remind us about you know the need for stormwater management and you know why it's important. Um, so I'm going to jump right into to what I'm going to talk about tonight. Like Caitlin said, we do have some questions for you guys, so feel free to, to answer in the chat and and and, and participate. Um, but I'll go ahead and start sharing my slides so we can get started here. Zoom the slideshow. There we go. Is everything looking good right now? Uh, it might be a little slow. I just I see. I'm not sure if it's in presentation mode yet. I can see the slides on the side. Oh, oh, hold on. Let me redo that. Yep, no you problem. Think, you'd think after two years of practice, I would know <laughs> what I'm doing by now, but. There always something happens. <laughs> I think I still had the previous presentation mode going from what we practiced for. How's that now? Hold on, it looks like it. I'm seeing it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can see your slide for sure. So okay. uh, yeah, go go ahead. All right. Let me just make sure I can advance it. Okay. All right. We're good. <laughs> all right. So thank you all tonight. Thank you for dealing with the, the two minutes of technical difficulties as we move through. Um, but thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to just talk to you guys a little bit about stormwater management, maybe um, some things you're already familiar with, but just to reinforce to you guys what stormwater management is, what it's all about, but also kind of get you guys rethinking how you look at stormwater. So we'll be asking you some questions related to what you think about stormwater and you know what what do you think of beforehand and what do you think of afterwards after I give you guys a challenge to think about stormwater differently. So jump right in. As Caitlin said, my name is Steve Yarjo. I'm with Rutgers Corporate Extension um, and an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural and Natural Resources. Um, I'm on the, the natural resources side. Um, I've been involved in watershed management and uh, coastal uh, water resource protection for about 25 years. Um, and I'm with Rutgers Corp Extension, which is part of the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station of the NJAES. And our role is really to take what's learned at the university and take that research-based information and take it out to the quote unquote real world. Um, we do public publications and we do things like this lecture or this webinar um, in taking the, the information that's kind of researched and studied and, and evaluated at the university out in applying it into, you know, people's everyday lives. So I always describe us as we teach everybody except the folks who actually paid tuition to go to Rutgers. So we teach everybody else. So with the natural resources work that I do, I work with um you know municipal groups like go green galloway and other green teams environmental organizations uh federal agencies um the general public and working with people and, and helping to protect our environment as well as other agencies within Rutgers, um like jc near and others as well um if you think about corporate extension you've probably heard of either 4-h or the master gardener program those are probably our two most popular ones but we are involved in marine uh coastal issues and commercial fisheries and aquaculture um horticulture um and ag um as well as water management and we also have our uh, nutrition and wellness programs as part of our family and community health sciences uh system uh department um there's the phone number for the 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 master gardener helpline if you have any questions um this is for the ocean county one so i apologize for the for the atlantic county folks and also have the website here but it will give you some more information as the type of work that i'm involved with and what we can do so i'm the core extension agent in natural resources but i work in both ocean county and in atlantic county um but most of my information is on the ocean county website so if you want to see of what what i'm involved with and what i do that's the best place to go so if you're interested in that so Steve, yep um i still see just your first slide i'm not sure if you're in presentation mode mm, i thought it was in presentation mode i mean maybe i'm not i'm not sure if i'm the only one but um uh maybe it's the it looks like you have different slide layouts sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but that's okay the other one get out of that no worries this is just part and par parcel of what we do i also have your slides uh, as well if you need me to share just in case okay can you see the slide at least the slide yes okay Clicked on presentation. How's that? 
Oh, hold on. Oops, screen sharing is paused. Hmm. That's strange. Yeah, it's just a blank screen right now. Like I said before, you would think after two years that I would. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. We'll get it figured out. And I have we have backup just in case. Just in case. All right. And close that. Maybe that's causing the problem. Okay. How's that? Uh, we see your screen, um, but still see the slides on the side, like your third, fourth slide. Um, okay. I'm not sure if you're in presentation mode still. Yeah, it's showing your second slide. Why does that happen? Oh, no, it just went away again. Yeah, I know. I'll put it in a presentation mode before chat. But it is odd. Yeah, it's like a weird gray screen, we say. All right. One of these days, we'll figure this out. Okay. How's that? Uh, I think it's still the same. Uh, we, I mean, I see the third slide. Um, okay. Do you want to try advance or do you want to just kind of like pick pick like slide four? Oh, maybe that helps. Try Is going it? to the next slide just to test. Oh, there we go. Okay, we, we found a workaround. <laughs> just like just like in dealing with storm waters, things yeah. just happen. Exactly. So. <laughs> Great. Back in the day, we used to call this adaptive management. So you would change your strategy. So you kind of have to do that with stormwater. So hopefully this will be seen as an exercise in, in dealing with stormwater as to something will come up that you don't really, you know, don't really have control over. So how do we handle that? So, <laughs> um, so as I was saying before, you know, that's what quarter extension is all about. But tonight I'm going to be talking to you guys about stormwater and just kind of cover the basics of, you know, what is stormwater? What happens to stormwater? What are some of the issues that have that happen with stormwater? Um, but also to kind of give you guys a little bit of a call to action, um, and that's to think about stormwater differently, um, and to think of stormwater as a resource um, that's available. Because sometimes you start thinking about stormwater, and some things come to mind. So that's kind of our first question for you guys: is when you hear stormwater, what do you think of? So please put into the chat, you know, what are some of the things you think of when you hear stormwater? So unfortunately for me in presentation mode, I can't see the chat. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to rely on Caitlin to kind of feed me some of the answers that might be popping up. But let me know when you hear the word stormwater, what do you think of? It rained today in parts of New Jersey. What did you think of? What was your first thought when you knew it was raining? All right. So, or just in general, what you think about stormwater? Oh, I see, I see the number of the chat going up. So people are participating, so. We've got uh, some answers so far. Runoff, runoff, flooding. <laughs> okay. We'll give you guys another like another 30 seconds or so just to kind of pop up what you think of when you think of stormwater. Do you think of anything else? Or if you gave one answer, if you have a second answer you're thinking of, what are you thinking of when you think of stormwater? Uh, someone put what's being carried into the bays. Okay. Well, all great answers so far. Awesome. You're you're on the right track of where, where I want you thinking right now. <laughs> it's like when you think of stormwater, what do you think of? And those are good answers. And those are those are probably common things that people think of when they think of stormwater. Water from a storm, how deep it is. Yes, those are all things we think of. So all of these things you're thinking of when you hear stormwater, you know, we ask people, what do you think of? So a lot of the common answers that we get have to deal with some of the things that you guys talked about. Well, do you think of this? So this is from the, the storms that happened last fall. Um, Ida, those other ones that came through. And we, we we were counting 2021 as being unprecedented in the amount of flooding that we got and the rainfall that comes up. So people mentioned flooding. So there's flooding issues that come up. Um, do you think about like the storm drains? And do you think about the pipes that go into our streams? Somebody mentioned all the stuff that's getting into the bays. Do you think of all just that network of pipes that's collecting all the water and just putting it into our streams? Are you thinking about that kind of stuff? Are you thinking about mosquitoes? You know, storms happen, water will puddle in areas, it'll puddle in items, it'll puddle in puddles on the land. 
it'll be breeding ground for mosquitoes. Do you think of mosquitoes when you think of, of stormwater? So do you worry about how deep the water is going to be on the road or how bad traffic is going to be when you're driving to where you need to go, whether it's work or someplace else or running errands? Are you worried about what the roads are going to be like? I always worry. I'm like, oh, what's the traffic going to be like? Because everybody slows down in the rain. How long is it going to take me to get someplace? So do you worry about the, the traffic? Do you worry about the safety when you, th do you think about stormwater? Do you think about any sort of flooding that's going to happen in any of the infrastructure that we have, like these detention basins? Do you think detention basins, and this could make you think of flooding as well, it can make you think of mosquitoes as well. Do you think about how well those systems are working to help control flooding? Are you thinking about like, is the, is the detention basin working and is it will it do its job that it needs to do? Or do you think about something like this, you know, obviously, um, we're coming up after uh, 10 years of uh, Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. Um, this is an aerial photo from Manaloking um, that showed, you know, obviously the devastation that happened. So do you think about like the catastrophic damage that can happen from a, a major storm event, obviously, you know, tied in with high tides, et cetera, for this one in particular, but do you think about that kind of stuff or home damage to your home or flooding that can happen there? Are those the kind of things that you're thinking of as well when you're talking about stormwater? Okay, so what is stormwater? I asked you guys, you know, to think about stormwater. What do you think of? So let's let's mention what it is. So stormwater is the form of water that comes from any sort of precipitation. Um, it includes like the the direct precipitation you can think of, like rain and sleet um, and snow, but it also includes the melting snow as well. So stormwater can happen, you know, in the winter time in particular days after the storm actually occurred. So we had rain, you know, in parts of New Jersey uh, in the past 24 hours, that's pretty direct. You're gonna get the rainfall happening. It's gonna hit the land surface. It's gonna go into whatever system it's gonna go into. And it's pretty direct. You can see the water on the ground, et cetera. But the snow is kind of a little bit, a little deceptive because you'll have it pile up in the areas and then it'll slowly get released as the weather warms up and it starts to melt. So then you have a longer term impact from the, 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 the snow melting. Um, you also get some accumulation of some materials in it, especially those that are put on the ground in terms of salt and sand to help with safety issues. So it could happen that as well. So the timing of, of, of storm water is, is critical when you're trying to deal with managing it. Is it an immediate issue with something like rainfall or sleet, or is it something longer term that you have to have a longer period of time that you're gonna work with? if it's melting snow over a couple of days or a week or so. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. But that's just the general idea of what stormwater is. So it's any sort of water that comes from precipitation or starts out as precipitation, whether it be directly from rainfall or if it's from the melting of snow. So what happens to stormwater? Well, I said it kind of goes through whatever system it goes into, but it's gonna depend um, on basically what surface it hits when it you know falls as precipitation obviously when it starts to melt as snowfall and it warms up you know it's going to depend on what kind of uh surface that the snow's been piled up on or it's accumulated on so depending on the surface it, it, it hits stormwater can get absorbed into the ground it can run off i was glad to see people said they thought of runoff when they, they heard of uh stormwater so you guys know what runoff is it can run over the land and not get absorbed into the ground um, it can fall directly into a body of water, and that's probably the best case scenario because it's going back to kind of the source. So it'll land into a stream or a pond or a local bay or even the ocean. Um, or it can evaporate back to the atmosphere. So if it hits a surface and doesn't get absorbed and just kind of puddles there, as the sun heats up that water, it'll evaporate it and cause it to go back to the atmosphere. So there's all these different pathways that stormwater can go down depending on what type of surface it lands on. So if it lands on a surface that's nice and spongy and can absorb it and is natural, it'll get absorbed into the ground. If it's a hard surface that it can't get absorbed into, it'll run off. Um, if it's a, a water body, it'll just become part of that water body and get added to it and stay there if it's like a holding area, like, you know, obviously the ocean or like a pond or a lake. But if it's in a stream, it'll work its way to the next water body. Um, or if it hits something that's like, not absorbent and is is warm enough to evaporate it it'll evaporate back to the atmosphere and so basically what i'm talking about here is the water cycle the hydrologic cycle 
which is basically just the movement of water through um, the land and atmosphere uh, systems that we have on the planet. So this is a nice schematic showing, you know, the movement of water. Water is moving through all the different arrows that you see in this. It will move from the atmosphere in clouds and then develop as rain clouds and become precipitation and go onto the land surface. And then whatever surface it lands on, that's going to determine what happens next. It can become surface runoff and it'll hit a water body and make its way eventually to the ocean. So you can see the arrow kind of on the middle left part of this diagram that says surface runoff. It'll run over the land. Um, it can get absorbed and infiltrate. So you can see in the cross section closer to the front of the diagram, you see infiltration into the soil and percolation. So the ground will start to absorb the, 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 the water, make it part of the soil matrix or move it even further down into groundwater or aquifers, which can be connected to other water bodies like lakes, ponds in the ocean in this example. Um, it can be utilized by the uh, vegetation that's there. You see some trees in that foreground. Um, you can also see some plants that look like row crops that are off onto the right hand side of the, the diagram. Or it can evaporate back to the atmosphere. So you can see those arrows going back up towards the clouds and back up towards the sun. Um, so this is the water cycle. It's the continuous movement of water as it goes from the atmosphere to the land surface into some sort of ground um, water or water body holding um, system that'll contain the water until it gets evaporated back to the atmosphere and then it'll become clouds, it'll fall back to the land and then that whole cycle will keep going. The two things to keep in mind are that this system is driven um, by two natural forces and that's solar radiation and gravity. So obviously solar radiation is heating up the water and evaporating it back to the atmosphere. Gravity is pulling the precipitation down back from the atmosphere as rainfall or as snow or sleet back to the land surface, and then also pulling it across the land surface as surface runoff and into the ground through infiltration. The second thing to keep in mind is that this cycle will happen continuously and kind of in perpetuity forever um, without any sort of intervention. So unfortunately, <laughs> because of people, there has been some interventions that have happened in this kind of system. So. What I like about this diagram is it clearly shows you what the water cycle and the hydrologic cycle is all about, but it shows a kind of an idealized system of, hey, nothing's really happened here. There's not really much management that's happened in our landscape, but that's really kind of a disruption that can cause some major issues with the hydrologic cycle. So these diagrams show what happens to those different components of the water cycle as we go through um, different development scenarios. So I know somebody threw out the word impervious before an impervious cover. I think it was Steve Fiedler. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. As you increase the amount of impervious surfaces, those asphalts, concretes, those hard surfaces, even compacted lawns can act like concrete. You're going to alter the different components that make up the water cycle. So that runoff, that evaporation, that infiltration I mentioned before. And so there's four different diagrams here that show an increasing amount of impervious cover as you go from the top left, which is natural ground cover and basically no impervious surface. Go to the right, it's 10 to 20% impervious surface. The bottom left is 35 to 50. Bottom right is kind of full build out. So it's a 75 to 100% impervious surfaces. Lots of roofs, lots of concrete, lots of roads, lots of asphalt, et cetera. But you can see the changes in those blue arrows, similar to the blue arrows in the previous diagram. You can see the changes in the blue arrows as you increase the impervious surfaces to those different components of the, the water cycle. In the upper left, let's look at the natural ground cover where there's really not that much uh, impervious surfaces. You can see that basically half the water that falls as precipitation will get absorbed into the ground through infiltration, whether it's shallow infiltration or deep infiltration. The remaining 50%, 40% will evaporate back to the atmosphere and go through the plants through transpiration. And that extra 10% will be our runoff. That'll be what flows over the, the, the landscape, gets to a local stream, gets to an area where it can be absorbed or infiltrated, et cetera. But then let's look at the other extreme where we go from no impervious surface to 100% impervious surface. So look on the bottom right of this, this graphic here. And you can see that those numbers change a lot. So instead of having 40% of the water in, uh, ev evaporate back to the atmosphere, you only have 30% uh, evaporating back to the atmosphere. Um, instead of having 50%, five zero, get absorbed back into the ground through infiltration, you have 15, one five percent getting back in the ground. 
So what happens to all that water? Well, now you have 55% over half of the, the, the rainfall that's happening becomes runoff. And so what do we do with that? And that's kind of where stormwater management steps in. So you have these storm events coming through. How do we manage, you know, the pieces that um, change as we alter the hydrologic cycle through, you know, development in this one particular case? You know, what do we do with that runoff? Well, you know, the old way of thinking was, well, we put it in a detention basin, we slowly release it over time so there's no downstream flooding. Or we, we slowly release it to another system that's another detention basin that holds it for a little bit while longer. And we kind of slowly release it over time so that the natural stream that it eventually goes to or the natural water body that it goes to can absorb that water um, much better rather than getting a full slug of this huge flood water coming through. But as I showed you in some of the pictures before, Last year, that really wasn't helpful for some major storms coming through. So we have to think about not just the changing components of the hydrologic cycle, but we have to think about the changing inputs, especially all the precipitation that's happening, how quickly it happens, and how much we're getting at each time. So these are all things that you have to think about when you're dealing with stormwater management. So this is just a way to show you that the way we develop our landscape really affects the different components of the hydrologic cycle. And really stormwater management is looking at that runoff piece. So how do we deal with increasing amounts of runoff with increasing amounts of development when we need you know, spaces for people to live in, et cetera. So this is really just looking at the changes to the hydrologic cycle and the amount of water going through a system. But one of the other things that happens when you have this increased impervious cover, where you have this increased development is you're not only changing the amount of water coming through, you're changing what's actually in the water as it's coming through. Oop, went in the wrong directions. Um, so I like to show this. These are all kind of the water quality issues that you have with stormwater and with runoff. Um, I refer to this as the alphabet soup of pollutants. Um, there's a variety of pollutants that are in here. Some of these can be seen as good things, per, per, particularly nutrients, um, when they're in small, small or moderate amounts. But when you have excessive amounts of uh, pollutants, that's when it can kind of become a problem, especially for something like nutrients. So these impervious surfaces, they don't allow the water to get absorbed into the ground, but they also are great when it's you know, not raining out or not snowing out to accumulate anything that might be in the atmosphere or anything that's applied to the landscape as well in terms of like fertilizers um, and, and atmospheric deposition of, you know, say uh, uh, traffic pollution or smog, et cetera, and what's tied up in that in terms of heavy metals and, and some heated materials and sediments, et cetera. So the ground gets really good at, at collecting those over a long period of time. And then you have a storm come through and it just picks up all that stuff and it washes it to the local waterway. So this kind of alphabet soup of all these blue boxes is really what you get over a long period of time and, and becomes part of our non-point source pollution and part, part of what's also called people pollution. So stuff that happens over everyday life that we're all part of. Um, so there are things in it that include sediment, you know, soil particles that are transported from the source. Um, if it, there's any sort of erosion of a stream bank or erosion of bare soil, or even the addition of things like sands um, to, to roadways for safety during winter, that can be part of that sediment as well. There's what's called the biochemical oxygen demand or BOD. Um, this is basically just carbon material that accumulates. Um, it includes um, uh, broken down uh, ve vegetation, you know, leaves, twigs, sticks, all that kind of stuff, stuff that would happen naturally in, in, in some undeveloped or forested kind of areas that, that, that get picked up. But they are a carbon source that when they get to a stream and they get utilized by the, the, the flora and fauna in the stream, they can actually, with that giant slug of carbon, actually decrease the amount of oxygen in the waterway for um, a lot of organisms that live there. So that's why they call it biochemical oxygen demand. It actually kind of sucks up a lot of the oxygen as that slug of carbon goes into the stream and gets utilized. But in addition to that carbon, you have these nutrients that are growing, uh, getting added uh, through um, uh, fertilizers, uh, through plant material. Um, we're ta primarily talking about nitrogen and phosphorus. If there are any gardeners or, or, or landscape enthusiasts out there, you guys are familiar with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, they are needed for plants to thrive, but you know, generally people tend to, to over fertilize or over um, do the fertilizers when they're putting it on their yard. So they need to think about how they do that. And I'll go into that in just a little bit. Um, there's some toxic materials, you know, we're talking pesticides, you know, herbicides, fungicides, any sort of kind of quote unquote poisons that are put out uh, to kill something. 
Um, there's also metals, you know, I mentioned some of the automotive exhaust and some of the, the traffic pollution um, that comes off of vehicles in terms of lead or mercury or zinc. Um, petroleum hydrocarbons that do come from exhaust from autos, um, as well as from fuel and, uh, and oil. So hydrocarbons are kind of your oils and greases kind of things. And then you also have things like pathogens and bacteria. These are things that can make you sick um, that come from primarily uh, the fecal matter of pets, waterfowl, failing septic systems. So these are anything that can kind of close down the beach and prevent you from swimming in it. If you come to contact with it, can make you sick. So you wanna be careful with those as well. Those can kind of build up on um, streets if people aren't picking up after their, their pets or if you have a large waterfowl population, et cetera. Um, one of the other ones that people don't think about is thermal stress. Um, the runoff that's going over the landscape, if it hits a surface like asphalt that's nice and dark colored, black, dark gray, and it's heated up in the summertime from the sun, it, any sort of uh, precipitation that lands on it that doesn't evaporate will get heated up slightly in that accumulation of all those um, little particles, those little water droplets heating up. As they get into a stream, they can actually change the temperature of the water even just a little bit, and that can cause some problems with development of some of the organisms that live in the stream, prevent them from um, laying eggs properly, it'll, it'll prevent them from uh, developing properly, et cetera. And then there's also physical debris. So we're talking about litter, illegal dumping, dumping and you know the big M word that people are probably familiar with now after a couple of years is microplastics and plastics that are making it into our um, environment. Um, I've seen some studies that have shown that microplastics are making its way into um, mineral water, uh, beer, wine, other foodstuffs. And a study came out this week saying that they found microplastics in people's blood samples um, that they took from, from, from donors. So um, it's pretty scary that it's pretty ubiquitous. We gotta figure out what's going on with it and how to actually reduce that kind of stuff. So um, one of the questions I did wanna ask you guys after going through all of these, um, another time for you guys to share your thoughts through the chat. What are some of the, 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 the pollutants and what are some of the, the, the problems that you guys are concerned about? Are, is it listed on this, this slide or is it something else that you're thinking of that is a problem? So go ahead and just pop into the chat what you guys think is you know, your, your, your big pro problem of concern. Um, it could be something from this list. It could be something else in addition. But what is it that's, that's it, your problem of concern? Ooh, toxics. Don't be shy, go ahead and let us know what you think. I know you guys are, are pretty um, environmentally minded, so I know you're thinking that there, there are problems that are local. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that is kind of local to your environment, it's just something that's kind of in your mind and what you're thinking of. Oh, come on, don't be shy, go ahead and give us an answer. I know there's a lot of people who are concerned about nutrients, you know, especially nitrogen, it can affect, you know, the quality of the bays. Um, <laughs> Caitlin, thank you. Yes, microplastics, after I said that, <laughs> we're finding it in every in, 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 in people's bloodstreams. Um, yes, everything is a valid answer too, if you're concerned about it all. Um, and the reason I'm asking you guys why, what, what your pollutant of concern is, um, is that that's part of when you start looking at watershed management or stormwater management. Um, you need to kind of have in your head, you know, what's your priority and what are we going to go after and what's the big issue that we're dealing with? Is it, you know, we want to make sure that all of our beaches are open and they're safe for people to swim in. So we're going to go after the bacteria and the pathogens. Are we concerned about all the algal blooms that are preventing like seagrass from growing in areas like, you know, um, Little Lake Harbor? Um, the uh, Barnegat Bay, Mullica River, you know, are we concerned about those areas because shellfish grow there and that's a great resource, you know, for, for, for local um, economy and, and, and tourism, et cetera. So you really have to kind of have in your head um, what the issue is that you, you want to kind of tackle and, and where you're going to go. Because as you can see, with stormwater management, not only are you dealing with all different modes of water moving through the system, you know, through infiltration and groundwater and surface runoff, but you have this kind of like, you know, soup of different pollutants that you're interested in. So you have to kind of target your efforts and figure out what the best strategy is to kind of deal with all this stuff. So it's a little bit difficult to deal with, with, with stormwater, but when you start thinking of it in a different way, rather than just the problems that are associated with, which I'll go into in a minute, um, 
you, you can kind of wrap your head a little bit more around it and come up with better solutions. So um, thank you all for giving me your thoughts as to what you think your, your, your pollutant of concern is and, and what you'd like to move forward with. Um, and, and, and there, um, one of the things that you, you can kind of tailor to all of these is you can be concerned about, you know, development and where and how much it happens, <laughs> you know, that you can think about that because that can help really deal with some of the water issues that I had mentioned previously and these water quality issues. Um, but if you are concerned about um, water quality and you want to learn more about um, local water quality, there's a great website out there by um, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, called How's My Waterway. It's mywaterway.epa.gov. And like I said, these slides will be made available to you guys so you'll have all the links, et cetera. But basically, you just have to kind of like put in your address and I'll tell you what the local waterways are and I'll tell you what the issues are surrounding them if there are any. It may be related to say, you know, fish consumption and there might be pollutants that are affecting your ability to consume local uh, fish and, and seafood. It could tell you that nutrients are a problem and you're seeing some of the algal blooms that people had mentioned. Maybe they'll say, oh, you can't go swimming because the beaches are closed because there's too many pathogens and too many bacteria. But it will tell you all that based on the, the, the different sub watersheds that are in this area, you know, related to the local waterways. So whatever your local waterway is. So if you want to just put in like a generic place and try to get all of the, <laughs> the mollica, you can do that as well. Um, if you put in Galloway, I'm sure you would get at least portions of, of, of the Mullica River watershed, so you can see what's going on with that. But it's a great resource to tell you um, what's happening in your local waterway. And this is um, updated, I believe, every two years based upon the, the EPA's uh, collection of statewide data and stuff. So you can actually look up any waterway. So if you're somebody like myself who didn't grow up in New Jersey, but you want to see what's happening you know, back home where you grew up and what's happening with local waterways. I grew up in Massachusetts, so I could put in my old address and I could see what's happening with that waterway and kind of see what happened, you know, and what I drank <laughs> growing up. Um, but if you're interested, this is a great resource and a great, great tool to utilize to figure out what's happening with local waterways. So in addition to kind of, you know, I, I, I refer to that portion as kind of like the gloom and doom uh, where we're talking about stormwater um, and talking about all the problems associated with it. One of the other things to keep in mind is that water, not just stormwater, but water itself is, is necessary for us to survive. Um, obviously on a basic level, we need it to drink, to, to, to survive on a daily basis. Um, but we also need it for, you know, all the functions that we go through the day, you know, you know, washing and, and, and growing food and being part of the manufacturing process for materials that we, we utilize on a daily basis, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately for New Jersey that with, you know, the amount of people that we have in this state. Um, uh, I don't know if we've hit 9 million just yet, um, but there are about 9 million people in the state. On average, there's about um, 70 gallons per day per person in New Jersey. So that's 630 million gallons per day being utilized. Um, and that doesn't even include any of the um, uses outside the home for like watering lawns or irrigating landscaping or growing a vegetable garden, et cetera. It more than doubles to about 150 gallons per day during the growing season, uh, primarily the summertime. Um, but, you know, water is a resource that we need to utilize every single day. So what can we do about stormwater to help protect that if there's something that we can do? Um, the, the, the slide's just showing, you know, the different uses of water, where it comes from in the map on the left. But then, you know, the stormwater, we talked about flooding. So that's kind of our overabundance of water, but there's times when water is really kind of scarce. So a few years ago, we had drought watches, if you can actually imagine that a few years ago after last year um, in this winter, and especially today, because we got some rain today, that we were under a drought watch for, for lots of portions of southeastern um, New Jersey. Um, Ocean County, parts of Atlantic County were, Burlington County was as well. Parts of North, North Jersey were, were impacted as well. Um, so you can see that water can be come scarce, even just on a natural variation. So despite, you know, the, the, the development that's going on and despite the, the amount of water that we utilize, if you can have a, a year where you have less rainfall even happening. So how do you manage stormwater when you're not getting that much stormwater? How do you manage a, 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 a smaller resource that's out there? But then on the flip side, as you guys mentioned before with flooding, you can have an overabundance of water. So stormwater management becomes this kind of 
long continuum that you have to think of because you have having these like peaks and valleys, um, these feast and famine <laughs> years where you have too much water or too little water. And some years you get just the right amount of water, um, which for the state of New Jersey is on average about 44, 45 inches of rain. Um, but even, you know, in the past couple of years, they were saying 2018, according to these um, headlines, was the wettest year on record in, in, in New Jersey for southeastern parts of New Jersey. And its wettest year on record was 2018. And then last year we get like Ida coming through and then we refer to 2021 as unprecedented. So, you know, we think we're getting too much. And then a couple of years later, we're getting even more than we had anticipated. So um, just keep in mind that, you know, when you're dealing with stormwater, it's gonna change even just on an annual basis or even a short uh, time frame of just a couple of years, Never mind the long, long-term changes that we're seeing. So we've got too little water sometimes, too much water other times, and how do we manage that to actually be useful for, um, you know, the, the, the people who need it? And since I started off by talking about the, the water cycle and then talk to you guys about the changes to it, the, the, the kind of charge I wanna give you guys is to think of water as a resource, especially stormwater, think of stormwater as a resource that's just kind of part of this hydrologic cycle and how can we get it to a system that's a little bit more in line with the natural system and that system that doesn't have that much impervious cover. How can we increase the amount of pervious cover and absorptive materials that can get water back into the ground, that can get water to um, a stream um, without going through you know, highly polluted areas? How can we get, get it there quickly? Um, how can we reduce the amount of things that we're using on the landscape that can impact water quality, et cetera? So one of the charges I wanna give you guys tonight is to think about stormwater in particular as a resource. Um, I had asked you guys before, when you hear stormwater, what do you think of? And if you think about what your answers were, they were kind of like a negative connotation. So we're talking flooding, we're talking problems, we're talking runoff, we're talking development, we're talking, you know, mosquitoes um, in one of the photos that I showed. So what I want you to do is kind of like flip the script a little bit and think of stormwater, not in terms of those problems, but this is a resource that we need to utilize for those times when we are in drought or how do we help control it when we have too much of it and it's flooding? But how do we keep it clean? How do we get it back into the ground? How do we go back to more of a natural way of doing um, the, the hydrologic cycle? So that's one thing I, I want to charge with you guys to think about tonight. So, so how do we actually manage stormwater? So, you know, to get you guys rethinking, we have to think about ways to actually manage stormwater. And, I, I love these three options. Um, the first one is don't create it in the first place. <laughs> so, which is kind of impossible. So we know that stormwater is gonna happen. So how do we create, um, create um, stormwater that's useful for us? Well, really the first one is kind of an impossibility because stormwater is gonna happen, rain's gonna happen, snow's gonna happen, snow's gonna melt. Um, so there are other options we have are to create legislation to help regulate it, which has been done or we can work to clean up any pollutants in stormwater before they become a problem in the stream. So starting to think about that natural water cycle and how can we get back to that, um, either through you know, green infrastructure, like someone mentioned before, or through any sort of legislature or any sort of regulations that are out there to, to do it. So I'm gonna give you guys a couple of examples of each of them, um, just to kind of give you a, 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 an idea of how we actually do manage stormwater, particularly in New Jersey. And we're gonna kind of forget that first bullet. <laughs> so we don't wanna create it in the first place. Primarily, we don't wanna create the pollutants in the first place, that's something we can manage, but the stormwater itself is gonna happen because of the rainfall is um, still gonna come. So one of the things that you can do is really um, manage the landscapes in a, 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 a thoughtful manner. Um, and one of the programs that we're involved with is Jersey Friendly Yards. Um, it started through the Barney Bay Partnership, but it's really a statewide website um, that's good for you know, anybody in New Jersey. Um, you can go to jerseyyards.org. Remember the double Y, J-E-R-S-E-Y-Y-A-R-D-S.org. Um, but what they do is they actually give you guys um, steps to creating a, a, an environmentally friendly and sustainable landscape that's also economically sustainable as well. Um, they have a whole bunch of features on their website 
If you haven't gone to this website yet, please go to it. Um, one of the best features they have on it is they have a searchable plant database. So you can put in the um, site conditions that you have on your property or at your house. And, you know, in terms of the amount of sun that it gets, the soil types, you know, if you know your soil pH or um, what your texture of your soil is, how, how much moisture is in the soil, uh, you can put all those factors in and then it'll tell you what plants will work, what native plants for New Jersey will work in your yard. So if you want to work move towards more of a natural or sustainable land, uh, landscape at home, you can do it through that. So it's a great resource and, and, and really fantastic. Um, oh, so this is a snapshot of the, 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 the plant database where it gets started. One of the things that you can do is you can register through the website and it's basically just putting in your email address and a password. Um, it doesn't get shared with anybody. And then you can actually, after logging in, you can save your list of plants and print it out um, and take it to like your no local nursery or take it with you when you go shopping for plants and you can kind of check off which ones you're able to find as well. Um, they also have a list of um, uh, nurseries that sell native plants uh, broken down by county. So Atlanta County, you're first. So you're right at the top of the list and it'll give you some of the locals um, that are growing native plants. So you can go out and actually develop your plant list and then know where to go to get the plants. But one of the things that the, the, the Jersey Friendly Yards website does is it outlines these eight steps you can take to have a Jersey friendly landscape. Uh, plan before you plant, start with healthy soil, water wisely, uh, fertilize less, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a second. Manage uh, pests responsibly, do integrated pest management and reduce lawn size. Um, you can also create wildlife habitat and then re reduce, reuse, and recycle uh, materials in your yard. Um, composting, um, re reusing, um, say if you break up a concrete patio, you can use those con that broken up concrete as pavers and another part, that type of, type of stuff. But I will tell you that if you go to the Jersey Yards website, jerseyyards.org, Jersey Friendly Yards, um, you can go to their events page and we do have a monthly webinar series going through each of these steps um, over the next several months. And actually on April 12th, I will be giving the talk on water wisely and telling people what they can do at home to help save water and also um, uh, not just conserve water, but help keep the water clean that comes off their property as well. So that's April 12th. Go to the Jersey Yards website for more information. Um, but I'm going to go to fertilize less because a big problem that we have is those nutrients I mentioned before, the nitrogen, the phosphorus. And what are some of the things that, 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 that are happening that can help to uh, keep people from over fertilizing their yards like I had mentioned previously. So back in 2011, uh, which seems like a lifetime ago for me, um, they did come up with new fertilizer legislation um, that was signed into effect by, by Governor Christie at the time um, and that did two things. Um, one of the things it did was it actually helped to create a standard so that there would be less um, nutrients um, within the, 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 the fertilizer itself. So effective in 2013, um, any sort of fertilizer that was used for turf products had to contain at least 20% slow release nitrogen. So this is nitrogen that's been uh, chemically altered so that it takes a long time to kind of release into the environment. So it doesn't just put this big slug of nitrogen. It takes its time. It works its way through the soil system and gets absorbed by the plants, um, which is actually a better way of, of, of applying your nutrients. And the second thing that it did as part of the um, nutrient content was to set um, a zero phosphorus need um, for your soils unless you take a soil test and that demonstrates that you need to add phosphorus. So it really was like, if you need to add phosphorus, do a soil test first to double check that you need to put phosphorus down. So that was one way to kind of control the amount of, of nutrients getting into you know, our, our landscape was by restricting the amounts that were being put out. The other thing it did was it created a certification program that um, was for professional landscapers and professional landscape companies um, to start getting trained on how to apply fertilizers properly. So they are trained to actually, you know, do a soil test, conduct the, the result, uh, consult the results, excuse me, um, and then utilize the proper so the fertilizers for the spot that they're trying to treat. Um, so far, there, there's been... Um, 
over 1,500 people who, who've been certified through this program. Um, it started out as part of um, the Department of Environmental Protection in partnership with Rutgers, and Rutgers has taken over this. So they are working on this certification. So they conduct trainings for um, landscape professionals to follow these steps um, in a manual of, you know, take a soil test, consult that soil test, make sure you're putting down the right amount, you're not over applying, et cetera. So making sure that they're basically following the instructions that they're supposed to for, for, for applying fertilizer and a way to kind of control the amount of fertilizer getting into local streams. Um, and it's called ProFact, the professional um, fertilizer um, uh, application certification and training program, I think is the, what the ProFact stands for. Um, and you can take a look at it at, at profact.ruckers.edu. Um, like I said, these slides will be made available, so all these links will be available to you guys. But one of the things you can do is you can go in and actually see what certified applicators are in your area. So you can search the table um, by, by the city, by um, the, the name of the company, if you know the name of the company, to see if they have actually been trained and certified to not put down excess amounts of fertilizers, which is fantastic. It's one of the biggest questions that we get all the time from people is like, oh, do you know of anybody who, you know, can install a rain garden, who will fertilize properly, who will, you know, people want to know what companies are out there that can help fit their, their mindset and their lifestyle and their hope of being sustainable. So this is a great resource that's that available through that. And like I said, these slides will be made available to you guys so you can see these links and, and use them later on. But the number one thing you can do, I wouldn't be a good extension agent if I didn't tell you guys to do a soil test, take a soil test. You can't know how much fertilizer to put down unless you know what's already in there. Just think of yourself. <laughs> if, if you're hungry and you're like, oh, I really need to eat something and I'm in the mood for X, Y, and Z, you know you're supposed to put something good and healthy inside of you. But how much do you need? How hungry are you? Well, it's the same thing with your soil. Your soil You don't know how hungry your soil is and how much nutrients it needs until you do a test to figure it out. You know, you know, within your own head, within your own stomach, how much food you're going to need. Some of us like to indulge a little bit more sometimes, but you, you, you don't know what's in your soil and you don't know how hungry that soil is for nutrients until you actually do a soil test. So one of the questions I would ask you guys is, have any of you done a soil test at home? It's like the number one thing that you can do. So that's what we're asking you guys is just put in the chat if, you told, if you've done a soil test. Yes, I see some yeses coming in. It's through the soil testing lab at Rutgers. It's a great general test to tell you how much nutrients are out there. Um, you get a report that tells you, you know, how much, so, how much you know, nutrients are in your soil right now, how much you should apply, how much you should add. Um, lots of yeses. I'm good to see that. Thank you so much. And, and if you haven't, that's okay. This isn't to shame anybody. Um, I live in, a, in a, a, a townhouse development and we have a company that comes and does this, takes care of the so soil in the yard for us. So, uh, you know, uh, they do the soil testing, fingers crossed, hopefully they do the aeration and all those things. So um, if you haven't done one, that's fine. Um, it's a relatively simple test to do. Um, they do provide all the information on the soil testing website through the, the experiment station. But after you do a soil test, they give you a report. I'm sorry if this is a little fuzzy and a little hard to read, but they tell you, you know, what the pH of your, 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 your soil is, what nutrients you have good ones of. In this example here on the bottom right, you can see the purple bars. There's plenty of phosphorus. It's above optimum of phosphorus. You do not need to add phosphorus to this soil here. It's a little below on, on potassium, so the K, the second bar down probably could use a, a fertilizer that's got some um, potassium in it. And the manganese, magnesium, excuse me, is below optimum as well. So you might wanna put something in that can kind of bump that up. And it does give you some information to help figure out what types of soil, um, excuse me, what types of fertilizers you can put out there. So they tell you, you know, they give you a written report, they give you those graphs, but they also give you um, a narrative of what you should do, uh, when you should do it. Um, usually it's um, late summer, early fall. Um, then they tell you your target ratio for your fertilizer in this first circle is one to zero to three. So that's the nitrogen, phosphorus to potassium, the NPK ratio. And then it tells you how much you should put down. This one says about 0.75 pounds um, of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. So it tells you how much to put down. But a lot of people don't have in their head, well, what's the right ratio and how do I do that? Um, but Rutgers also has a website. 
<laughs> that was set up as part of the, the soil testing lab where you can put in the ratio and it will spit out a list of, of fertilizer products, brand names that fit that ratio. So if they tell you that one to zero to three, you can put that in this website and go one to zero to three. It'll be like, okay, here's the, the name brands and here's the, the ratios you wanna get them in. So it's really, you know, nice and user-friendly to help find a fertilizer. Um, you can check off that it only includes organic fertilizers. So you can have that option. So if you don't wanna put down a chemical fertilizer, you can put down something a little bit more organic and, and, and do that as well. But the number one thing you can do um, is if you're a homeowner, um, is to do a soil test so you know what's in your soil before you start putting anything down. Um, I just want to point out that there are um, a host of other folks who have other expertise besides myself um, who have talked about various um, sustainable landscaping issues, um, soil testing, etc. If you go to our web page for Ocean County for RCE, that's the one at the top, we've got all of our webinars that we've done over the past two years uh, recorded and up on the, the site. Same thing with our Earth Day Everyday webinars. If you haven't heard about it, I work with some of the other natural resource agents to do this program called Earth Day Everyday, um, which helps give people tools that they can utilize every single day to, to live a more sustainable lifestyle. Um, and not just landscaping, but you know, dealing with plastics, dealing with um, any sort of flooding issues, how they can help coastal resources, et cetera. And then, as I mentioned before, we have Jersey Friendly Yards webinars. Um, the ones we've done over the past couple of years have been recorded and are on this website, as well as the upcoming ones we have that, that are happening throughout 2022. So all these um, links will be on the, the, the slides that you'll be able to get after tonight's talk. So I mentioned, you know, the three ways to, to, to manage stormwater. You know, the first one I just talked about was really, you know, cleaning it up after it's released or not to release it in the first place by using less fertilizer. So let's talk about some of the regulations just briefly. Um, I will tell you, I am not a policy person. <laughs> um, I have a PhD in environmental science, not in policy. Um, but I'll kind of give you guys just a general overview of, of, of what's been done to help um, manage stormwater on the regulatory side. And it's primarily through the Department of Environmental Protection, the New Jersey DEP. And they came out with a set of stormwater rules back in 2003, which that also seems like a lifetime ago, um, that were set up to establish basically general requirements for developing and conducting and implementing stormwater management plans and any sort of stormwater control ordinances that towns wanted to enact to help to uh, reduce stormwater or clean up stormwater. Um, it also established um, standards for the design and performance of any sort of stormwater management system or measure or BMP or best management practice. So it established the standards um, for those in terms of how well they'll work and how they should be designed. Um, and then it also established safety standards for stormwater management basins. So obviously stormwater management basins help to reduce flooding. So make sure we have a set of safety standards for those to ensure that they're not gonna deteriorate over time. They're not gonna cause problems further downstream by causing excessive flooding, et cetera. So that's the basics of what the stormwater rules back in 2003 did. And what they did was they set up um, the set of um, tiers for municipalities, tier A and tier B. Um, tier A municipalities were like ones that had to get on the ball and work on these stormwater rules right away. Tier B were kind of secondary and they had a different set of standards that they had to kind of meet. And there were some uh, municipalities that were exempt uh, from it. There were about uh, eight municipalities that were exempt from, from the stormwater rules, but the majority of the state did have to follow these rules and, and, and develop ordinances or come up with some sort of stormwater management plan. One of the things that you guys will be happy to know is that Galloway is one of the ones in the tier A. <laughs> so they do have um, a, a, a stormwater management plan and a stormwater management um, system uh, run through the town and run through public works. So this is the website for the Galloway Township. So for those of you who are in Galloway who didn't see this, here it is. Um, if you are someone who doesn't live in Galloway, your town probably has something similar along these lines or through the Atlantic County Utilities Authority or um, Atlantic County um, administration um, may, may be looking at it as a county basis um, because the ordinances and the stormwater management um, can be done on a regional basis. It can be done on a county basis. It can be done on a municipal basis, depending on you know, what waterway you're looking at and what you want to protect. But one of the things that I thought was great about the Galloway Township website and provided a lot of information was they did mapping of their stormwater outfalls. 
um, a lot of towns um, started to do this just so they could see where the storm, storm water that they collected within town was going to. So it'll collect throughout the town. So these are just a few that, that are mapped out for the town, township of Galloway. Not, from my understanding, not a lot of towns have done this. So kudos to Galloway for doing this, but you can actually help to manage the stormwater by knowing where it's gonna have the most impact and that's where it's coming out of. So knowing where the outfalls are, it's a great resource you know, to, to have to be able to map out the, the, the systems. So I've kind of charged you guys with thinking of um, stormwater as a resource and showing you different ways that it can be managed and some of the issues that are coming with it. So hopefully you can start to think about other things. So before I ask you, you know, when you think about stormwater, what do you think of? And we got runoff, we got flooding, et cetera. What I want you guys to kind of like think about are not the problems that come from stormwater, but the benefits that come from stormwater. So now when you think about stormwater and you think of stormwater as a resource, that's the important thing, what will you think of? You know, will you think of the benefits that come from it and stuff? And I mentioned, you know, we utilize it for our everyday, you know, needs to survive. We use it for growing our, our crops, et cetera. But when you think of stormwater as a resource and we're working to help clean it up before it becomes a problem or if there's too much of it, do we think about our beaches and our beach safety and our tourism industry for, for many coastal areas of New Jersey and the shore of New Jersey? Do we think about the, the um, food resources that are available through either fish, um, shellfish or other seafood that's available? Um, do we look at um, you know, the, the, the oysters and the, the hard clams that are out there and primarily uh, Barnegat Bay, but I also know in Mullica River, um, huge shellfish in industry. Do we look at you know, the, the, the resources that come out of that? Do we see it as something that we can collect and utilize at home in our own vegetable gardens? Do, can we get a rain barrel and collect that resource and utilize it in ways at home rather than using you know, our potable water system from, from the tap? You know, do we see it as a resource that we can kind of capture on our own and utilize in our own spaces, et cetera? Same thing with rain gardens. Do we think about you know, the native plants and using less fertilizer and using less water? Um, do we want to make sure that we're, we're putting in plants that will help local insect populations or local native po pollinators, um, native birds, etc.? Or do we think about even just our drinking water? You know, I mentioned all the infiltration before into our groundwater and our aquifer system. That's part of our drinking water system. So we think of our, our stormwater as a resource that we're eventually going to drink. You know, we should think about ways that we can kind of keep it clean so that we can ensure we have a plentiful supply for the future and stuff. And that's my time and that's my talk. And thank you all so very much for joining us uh, today. Um, but I will, you know, I've got a few minutes to take, take some questions if people have some questions, but thank you so very much for, for, for your, your time and attention. And, you know, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Steve. That was fantastic. We're gonna give you a, <laughs> If you want, you can give Steve a virtual round of applause. You can use little reactions that we've got, um, or uh, or just um, you know you can take yourself off uh, the camera as well and give a thumbs up, uh, wave, clap. Uh, but thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, some uh, people did put um, at the end of your talk uh, about groundwater recharge. Um, so you were just mentioning, you know, drinking water. So, um, so there you go. When people are thinking about stormwater now, um, so uh, if we do, uh, we are a little bit over time. But if you do have some questions, we will take a few minutes for questions. Put them in the chat. Take yourself off mute, uh, whichever you'd like. So I'll give a few seconds and see if anyone has questions for Steve today. We, we did get a little off to a little bumpy start. So we got a couple of minutes. <laughs> That's true, yep. <laughs> but hopefully hopefully you guys learned that, you know, when we started, when I started this asking you guys about how, what you think of stormwater, you thought of all the problems that come with stormwater. So hopefully you see this as an opportunity. To, to, to actually help to, to be a part of the solution to, to help improve water uh, water quality or reduce the amount of flooding that's coming off it. Yeah, and I love how you said that, Steve, is thinking of it as a resource and thinking of it more as, as a positive. Um, mm -hmm. And I will say that Jersey Friendly Yards website is fantastic. I've used it for my own home. I have stormwater issues. Um, I think about it all the time because my house sits at a slope from the, the road. Um, so we've taken many, many measures. And one of them is to put in a native plant garden and it keeps my front yard um, a little bit drier. 
<laughs> not as muddy. Yeah. I'll say that. We, we love those kind of testimonials on that, that website. It's a fantastic yeah. website. And everybody's praised like the native plant database because I think that's what people really wanted. They were like, I, I want to know what will I be able to grow in my yard? What will survive in my yard? And that's been great. So um, I did put a rain barrel workshop um, that the Barnegat Bay Partnership is doing on June 4th uh, and an email in there, uh, Karen Walzer, and I believe it's their watershed ambassador for uh, the for that region, um, which is watershed management area 13, Barnegat Bay. Uh, they have a rain barrel workshop going on on the 4th. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, oh, is it virtual or in person? I think it's virtual. But I actually don't know. Um, I would email Karen uh, at that email right there, unless someone else knows more information about that who's participating tonight. Um, so uh, I would email her to confirm whether it's in person or virtual. That's a good question. All right, uh, anything else? Uh, someone says, thank you uh, for doing the every drop counts rain barrel display we use in Atlantic and Cape May counties. Oh, cool. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> they're they're, they're um, water conservation displays that we have going through um, Atlantic um, and Cape May counties in partnership with um, the Atlantic County Utilities Authority and a Amy Cook Menzel. Um, she helps to oversee the Atlantic Cape May hub of the sustainable Jersey. So we developed a, a, a freestanding water conservation display that green teams can use as part of their um, uh, 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 the, the sustainable Jersey certification points. Um, and it also counts towards your education for your stormwater management permits too. <laughs> so it kind of does tie into what we we're talking about tonight. Um, and we have another one that's kind of making its rounds through Ocean County as well right now. It's right now in the Stafford Township um, Municipal Building. Um, I don't know where the, uh, the Atlanta County one is right now. I know Amy's, Amy's been in charge of that one, but she's been a fantastic partner on that project, so. It's in Ocean City. It's in Ocean. Thank you, Ralph. I appreciate that. <laughs> I feel like I've just let it loose on the world and let it go on its own. So wherever it winds up is fantastic. So. <laughs> we've, we've had it in six different libraries over the past uh, seven or eight months here in Cape May County. Oh, cool. And uh, also uh, sharing your handout and everything with it. It was a great resource. Thank you for doing it. Oh, no problem. That, that just came about from a conversation we had at a Barnica Bay partnership meeting where somebody was like, we need more water conservation education. So um, in a world where I, I, I'm only one person, <laughs> it made sense to come up with a display that could travel around it and, and kind of do that kind of education for us rather than having me you know, I, I, I could talk to the world virtually now, but at the time it was, how do, how do I divide myself? And that was to come up with that display. So, but I'm glad it's worked out for you guys. That's fantastic. It was a great job and it's a good resource. Thank you. Yep. And it actually helps with your sustainable Jersey and your stormwater management permit. So that's the important thing is that it actually helps. Awesome, that's good to hear. Um, uh, Steve Fiedler just put a reminder about the ACUA Earth Day is back uh, April 24th from 10 to 4. Thanks, Steve. And then someone, this is a good question. Uh, let me know where you're getting rain barrels for workshops. Thanks for, uh, for providing your email. Um, Steve, any thoughts on getting rain barrels? Um, I, I feel like there's more people doing rain barrel workshops and fewer and fewer resources of, <laughs> of rain barrels that are out there. So I feel like it's kind of like a, a guarded trade secret <laughs> in knowing where we get barrels. I will tell you that for the, the rain barrel display that we did that, that Ralph mentioned, the water conservation display, we actually purchased those through Amazon, but they were pretty expensive. They were about $80 a piece. Um, but if you're looking for something that's like food grade, et cetera, um, I don't know if they're still around, but I know there used to be either in Monmouth or Ocean County, like a, a Pepsi. <laughs> distribution center where they used to have like the, 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 the soda syrup um, in the, in the barrels. So you could get them through them. Um, I know that you can get them from car washes, um, which is a place I used to get them from um, because they get the concentrate of their soap in the 55 gallon drums. And since it's basically just soap at that point, it's, it's, it's not something you terribly have to worry about. Just make sure you rinse it out a couple of times before you use it. 
Um, I know that others have gotten them from, um, I feel like I'm giving away trade secrets here. <laughs> I know that others have gotten them from um, marinas and, and yacht clubs um, because they get um, uh, some materials in those uh, 55 gallon drums. I would just say, make sure you know what's in those barrels before you clean them out and make sure it's a material that's gonna be safe to utilize. Um, obviously if people are going to be using it in the yards, you want to be careful of them using it in like any sort of like vegetable garden or anything they're going to consume. Um, you want to make sure you're on top of it. That's why looking at like the food grade stuff. Um, I know we used to get them back when I worked up on campus, we got them from pickling companies. So they smelled fantastic. They would have smelled like that, that, that vinegary pickle. Um, but those are some of the resources that you can utilize. So, I mean, the marinas, car washes, um, you'll only get a few at a time, but after a while, you can kind of build those up. So those would be some of the places you can do that. I've also heard that was going to be what I was going to suggest pickle, like go to restaurants and see if they have them as pickle barrels. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, different resources, different folks uh, may have them also try Amazon. They might sell just the generic, like plain kind, but also they sell some really fancy ones too, <laughs> um, which like Steve mentioned cost cost more. <laughs> Um, all right. And also, oh, Stafford Township Green Fair. Cool. So that's happening on April 29th. Lots of uh, Earth Day fairs going on to promote um, uh, things like uh, stormwater management for sure. Um, so this is a topic I think everyone's going to be talking about over the next uh, month or so, um, you know, at length. So um, really great information. Um, I will also put in here uh, our uh, two upcoming workshops um, that I mentioned at the beginning. I promised a registration link, so I'll just pop that in there as well. Um, any final questions, thoughts? All right, so I will send everybody also um, an email uh, tonight or tomorrow with those slides as well. Um, and thank you again for your time, Steve, and thank you everybody for attending. Um, thank you, Steve. No problem. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for, 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 for bearing with this tonight and being here. I really appreciate it. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good, good night. night. Take care.